the, the, the first process, we're, the, it all, the process truly begins when we get a script. So once we have the script, um, I basically work with Gary to go through it and kind of isolate the elements which we think that visual effects is basically going to help with the storytelling. Well, the plan was a different show for us. Uh, honestly, when I first saw the script for the plan, my reaction was, well, there's nothing in here for us. Uh, uh, the, the first script came out and there, there really wasn't very much, as far as the visual effects were concerned, it was very underwritten. Um, there was no mention of seeing the colonies. For instance, when the colonies are under attack, there's no uh, ships moving into position. For us, it was, we looked at it and said, well, there's not that much for us to do. Luckily, uh, I had someone like Gary Hutzel and wonderful people like our people here in Post, Andy Seckler, who did the editing, and Paul Leonard, who supervises Post, and it was these amazing people giving me guidance because I think of myself as an almost an auditory writer. I'm very much about the dialogue and the sound uh, of, of the voices and I can look at an idea and go like, oh, that's fantastic. But I, don't, I wouldn't have come up with, let's have a, a boat sailing overhead and crashing in the harbor and all this stuff. That's, and I was so lucky to be surrounded by these people who, who didn't wait for me to say, give me a, a shot of centurions walking down the bridge, give me the shot of this boat crash. They just, they came up with it and showed it to me. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? So I was in the wonderful position of just going like, wow, fantastic, yes. When the story starts to take hold and you start to develop it, in the editing process, you start to realize what you're gonna need. And then you start to think about it and it starts to tell you what exactly you need. One of the things that we understood from the beginning of this show was that the planets had been attacked. And we showed it in the actual series, but not like we showed it in the plan. That was really the key. I said, we, I wanna see the grandeur of the attack force of the Cylons when they hit us. I wanted the, us to go, whoa, there was no way for us to really combat this. When we pre a shot, when, when we're putting it together, when we take the idea of what the script lays out for us, and it says, you know, uh, Cylons attack this ship, uh, uh, one of the artists or whatever will uh, put that shot together using stand-in objects, you know, low res, so it renders very quickly and we can get some immediate feedback, and obviously the shot will get all dressed up and, and look spectacular for final, but we don't need all of those polishing effects to have the producers and whatnot sign off on, yeah, we like the way that looks, let's get that in the show. As we started getting into it and started evolving it with the director, with Eddie Almos, uh, it, we began to get a feel for the kinds of things he wanted to see in the show. And then as we got into post and, uh, and uh, Ron Moore got involved and uh, he wanted to go in some other directions as well, we really began to flesh it out. And we ended up with a show that was fairly heavy in visual effects. In this, in this particular case, the show was complicated. There's a lot of visual effects. There was, uh, I, I think, some rewriting that went on in post with uh, Ed, Edward James Olmos and Andy Seckler. I think, they, I think they improved the project, but it complicated things as far as visual effects couldn't get started just based on a script and provide the shots and be done. We had to wait till Eddie was kind of through his director's cut before they could really dig in and try to make the sequences that Eddie envisioned. We started to build up those sequences more to really build up the anticipation of the attack and really give you the impact of, of, the, uh, of the attack on the colonies. Where the hybrid is listing off all 12 colonies saying, you know, the harbors of Pycon are burning, the cities of Caprica are burning. You know, when Andy and Eddie were editing the show together, they had the hybrid, they had the dialogue, it was all scripted, but we didn't have any previs done for that. In fact, I don't believe, according to the script, the actual destruction of cities was something that was scripted to be seen. It was talked about and the hybrid was sort of listing it all. That's one of the great things about Galactic is that it's a very fluid process, you know, that there's, uh, even after the show is written, after it's shot, um, there's still a lot of flexibility in the types of visual effects and how we can sort of tell the story in post and expand on the story that was written or shot. And then there was this whole discussion about the lyrical nature of that sequence and what she's saying. The hybrid is saying, if you take her literally, the cities of Caprica are burning. Well, Gary's idea was, well, we can do that. But 
In order to show the cities of Caprica burning, we actually have to build the city in CGI, and then we have to destroy it. So why not, since we have to go to the trouble of building the actual city, why not show the before and then the after? Even though she's actually just saying the cities of Caprica are burning, take a shot, show us a little bit before, dissolve into the after. It's not a literal interpretation of what she's saying, but you get it. The audience gets it, and it's interesting, and it, the shots are beautiful, and why not use them? To me, that's the best example, certainly from the plan, of how you know, the visual effects came into being over a six-month period. Uh, the way it works is uh, for every show, uh, we pretty much uh, check together like which, uh, what, what we have to build. And uh, from there, uh, it's really, I have a design. I, sometimes we have a design, but uh, Gary have the last word if he liked the design or not, or he usually give me a lot of freedom. So uh, from there, uh, I have the choice to keep the design the way it is or just modify it and make it more stuff like I have an idea to, to modify or Gary, if you have an idea over that. So it's kind of a teamwork about like, okay, what, which, which direction uh, we want to go. Gary and I go over it and we discuss it and uh, then we, we talk about who we think. I mean, we know everybody has a specialty and everybody has a certain temperament and you have to be kind of a, you know, a, a psychiatrist too, you know, <laughs> to know who, who's the guy to put here and who can work together and stuff like that. Sometimes we'll just bring everybody in, like, like if it, like in Razor, where it, it's, a, it's a huge, or, or in the plan where we have uh, the destruction of the colonies. You bring everybody in, you know, and you sit down and you just start kicking around ideas and people go nuts. I have to say, uh, like everything, I qualify this because this is not how it is everywhere. You know, like this is, this is for me, just the most golden opportunity ever as an animator because from day one, when they get the edit done, uh, the writers on the show uh, have been really, really cool about this. And so the producers and directors. Sometimes they just say, okay, s stick the battle here in the script. And just, this is where the battle goes. And they just basically just say, get us from point A to point B. And that's it. They don't write, oh, the centurion approaches and slashes across his chest. You know, some writers are so fastidious about every action has a, you know, you know, a written piece of whatever in a script, but you know, the, the writers that we have are really kind of hands off about that stuff, and I was, that's shocking. Ron had an idea when we were thinking we were going to do multiple missiles plummeting out of the base stars in orbit and just have all these launchers come out and just boom, 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 boom. And he goes, What about a MIRV, which is a, it's like a, a nuclear missile with multiple warheads on it, so it, you know, flies up in the air, then boom, disperses about 20 or, you know, nukes or whatever like that. It's, it's real bad news. So, Let's go, that's a great idea. So we had Pierre build something that's really nasty and uh, just started thinking, what if this thing is such a nasty weapon, it's not even propelled. It's just spring-loaded, boom, it's just shot out of the base star, falls into orbit, just gravity taking it down. And as it comes down, the cowling blows off and there's a shot of it where we're, we're on it like this, the cowling blows off and you see there's like six or eight warheads in it. You go, oh God, that's just terrible. Then the secondary cowling blows off and you realize I think there's 13 warheads in it. And it's just nasty and it comes down, boom, all the missiles go away. And so you realize that's 13 thermonuclear weapons falling in unison on the city, so. I think the VFX guys um, are brilliant artists and they do a great job. Uh, and they're big storytellers. They're always looking to kind of enhance, you know, they never want to just use establishers or here's the fleet. They always want to give us a little something more to help support this, the show and the story, which is great. Um, honestly, my main responsibility is making sure that the people who need to see the shots have seen the shots. I don't want Ron or David to be surprised when they show up on the mix stage or worse off when they see it on the air. Like, I never saw that. That's not at all what I had in mind. In this case, we sent it to Jane, Ron, and David Ike, and we get their notes back um, and try to, try to find some common ground that every, everyone agrees on. And it may take uh, back and forth another you know, week to three weeks, four weeks to get through producer's cut and make sure we know exactly what's gonna stay in the show. And when we have a sense of how big the show is, is immediately turn it over to visual effects and uh, start to lock plates, green screen, set extensions, things that are dependent on photography and give all those plates to visual effects. Jim created the, the huge nuke that you saw but he created it in a way that can just be imported into the 3D space. So we can literally take his work and just put it over here, put it over there, and, and reuse it.
So once that process is done and, and the shot's approved, then it'll come over here and we'll replace all of the objects and, and build them up with all of the final models and everything so it looks spectacular. Pretty much uh, Kyle Toucher did an animatic for that. He had kind of a rough idea of panning up to see this big giant nuke so you felt like you were really in the heat of it. And then Gary went out and he shot a couple of live action, well, not live action, but they're dummy dead bodies. So we brought that in as a plate and then we erased the floor and we put it in a computer generated floor and then I added some computer generated temples and fire and uh, Jim May created a computer generated nuke and we just kind of married the shot all together and then it was done. More often than not, when I get a scene, it's already been, been pre -vis. The The basic animation's been set up. And uh, so what I have to do is figure out what touches need to be added to it to fine tune. A lot of times Gary will have, you know, specific things that he wants. Like, I want you to blow this building up, or uh, I want you to, you know, give me give me fire here, or give me blood there. So I'll go in and spot all of those different places and figure out what I need to do. I spent a lot of time actually working on just doing ground uh, pebbles and dust that the Cylons are kicking up as they're walking by. And it's not a lot of stuff that's very, um, dramatic, you know, when you think about in the grand scheme of effects, but it's something that if it wasn't there, uh, this, the, uh, the audience would notice. So there's the 3D artists and they set up the shots, all of the effects, and they send it to us once they're done with it. And we take a look at the shot, we replace the geometry with the final geometry. Normally they put in previs objects um, just to kind of speed up render time and we replace those objects with the final objects and we look at the scene and try to determine how we're going to break it out. Once the shot has gone into uh, breakout, we call it, and that's where the guys uh, go in and they actually separate out the elements into different passes. So when we get a shot, say, of a centurion walking in a background, we'll have a pass that, that is called a diffuse pass and it'll be like shadow and shading and, and really flat muted color. Then we'll have a uh, fill pass, which we use, we dial in just enough to actually fill in any shadow areas. So if you have anything that's like really dark, you want to be able to see anything. Because if it pinches to black, it's going to look really bad on, on TV. You're going to see really flat areas. So you want to be able to see the detail in the shadows. Um, we'll have an interactive pass, which will, like if they're walking under lighting, that's uh, interactive. The light actually moves over their body and you'll see it pass through. And we dial that in. We'll break out different elements. So when Gary is looking at a shot and he's like, oh, you know, uh, uh, this object's kind of getting washed out. I want to pump this up or I want to bring this down or I, I want to add an effect just right here uh, because of the elements that we create, the different layers uh, for compositing to work with, uh, that gives Gary the type of control that he wants to create the shot. And that process is called breaking out or, or break out a shot. If it's not separate, that's, you know, comp does not have that control. And that's why it has to go that way. And a lot of the times, it allows us all the flexibility that after we render, so that comp can dial in, it allows us the flexibility not to have to re-render the entire shot. In this shot here, uh, we're gonna break this out where we've got four base stars here right in the foreground of the camera. And as the uh, camera moves, you'll see that, you know, uh, right here, we're dead on to a base star, and obviously that's where the, the start of the shot is uh, coming from, and then that's gonna move off camera, and we reveal this rest of the Cylon fleet, and you get this ominous impact of the destruction that's about to take place. So uh, those foreground ships are gonna be broken out separately with the highest detail model, uh, and again, that's where Comp will spend most of their time really glossing those and making those stand out great. Uh, the planet itself is going to be broken up into several different layers. We'll render the surface of the planet separately from the clouds of the planet, separately from the atmospheric haze of that planet. Uh, and then we'll also use a little layer just to block out the stars through that atmospheric haze, uh, because that's just how it looks through a NASA camera. And we're always using any type of real world stuff we can as reference to do what we're doing. And then the, the fleets here in the background, this is where we're gonna use these lower level detail objects because you can't really see the little spine guns that stick off the arm of each base star and whatnot. So they won't be there on that object, but because the shape is so recognizable, you know, the whole shot will sing together. And with the detail in the foreground, your mind's eye 
will just blend it into the background. And then from there, you start breaking it out into all the different elements, and each element gets broken down in its sub-elements. Once we have all that, you know, and through the process, we're checking frames to, for the quality to make sure that is the right thing, and then we send it to the farm. A render farm is a bunch of machines that sit there doing the math um, to make the frames. They are, the artist will do the scene, and then the breakout artist will split it up into different elements, and then uh, it will go to the farm, and the farm will render each element. Uh, as a frame that will take anywhere from a couple seconds to hours and hours for each individual frame and each frame of video that you see might consist of 20 or 30 elements. These are our current render engines so it's 16 CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM in one of these machines and so we've got 20 of them running right here. You will see we've got uh, two separate portable air conditioning units in addition to um, the building air conditioning coming into the room. Just piles of machines everywhere that are used for different things. It would get to the point where if you came back here and stood against this wall, uh, it would be really too warm to stand here. It would be 140, 150 degrees. Right now we've got some interesting fan systems going on, uh, including a system that pulls air out of the back of the machines. And everything in here is just trying to get cool air around the room. On Battlestar, we're defined as a light wave house. On a television production schedule, there really isn't a tool yet that is more efficient than light wave for 3D. It is designed so that you can work with it out of the box. You might buy a plug-in or two, but you don't need programmers to even get the basics done. And in most of the other packages, you do. We've used software called View for some terrain generation here and there. We've used a program called Synthize for match moving and, and 3D tracking. We've used mostly combustion for compositing. When we first get the shots, 3D has created all the elements and animated everything. And when we get the shots, it's uh, a lot of layers broken. Each element is broken down into several different layers, different lighting passes different elements for us to create the shot, um, putting it all back together to make it look real, camera real, photo real. <laughs> I wanted the people to see the plan to really be able to get the feeling of what the human, human race was up against, and we did it. <laughs>